What's up? It's episode 129, Pain Points of Wealth, and markets continue to chug along, the Dow having its best streak since 1987 as money continues to pile into this market. Economic data still coming in. Well, pretty good. Inflation numbers continue to come down. The Fed could be done with their interest rate policy. They may stop raising interest rates, so we got a lot to talk about today. We're going to give you our viewpoint here with the economy to the end of the year. We're feeling good. We're going to tell you why. And on the tipping point today, we're going to talk about cash management. Interest rates have gone up a lot. Are you making the right decisions with your money right now? Well, we're going to tell you exactly what we think. Check it out. We have a phenomenal show. Guys, uh, this you time right, last year, 100% of economists were predicting we'd be in recession. So, Chris, I know you're heading up, do a little sailing uh, next month or this month coming up. I'm going to give you some advice. If 100% of your crew is on one side of the boat, get to the other side. <laughs> yeah, it does create for a pretty tippy situation. But, you know, to, to Ryan's point, you know, I don't think the really market really cares what the Fed's going to do. You know, they raised rates a quarter of a point the other day, and it didn't even burp. You know, I think a lot of this stuff is priced in at this time. Well, you guys, you know how interest rates work, right? It, it, you go up on an escalator or in a staircase, and it's torturous and it's slow. But when they come down, you, you go down an elevator shaft. So I think what investors need to really be thinking about right now is that rates are probably peaking, and you really want to position your portfolio for when those rates start to drop because they're going to come down like two, 300 basis points in the blink of an eye. And this is what I think a lot of people don't realize, Bob, and I'm glad that you bring this up is we've been having a lot of clients who are putting money in treasuries or even just saying, oh, my money market's getting almost 5%. That's great. Why don't I leave it in there? The problem is your money markets are floating rates. And so if rates come down, that's going to come down pretty quickly. But even your certificates of deposit and your treasuries, it's great if we're getting 5% over the next year, but we very well could be in a scenario a year from now where we're reinvesting into lower rates and then we're out of luck. And so you need to make sure you have a longer term plan in place. Yeah. And I think, you know, the other thing, too, is that Chris made a good point. It's just like it, usually on Fed day, everyone's freaking out, going crazy. The markets go crazy. This is the best Fed day ever this past week. I mean, Jay Powell spoke and nothing happened. <laughs> so I think that is an anticipation that the Fed is probably done raising interest rates. And you know that's great for the overall economy too because it creates clarity. And that's you know, one of the biggest issues when it comes to the market is markets crave certainty. And when they get it, you know you see things really go off to the races. And I think that's one of the reasons why the markets had such a strong run in the last month or so is because the consensus now is we're pretty much probably done with raising interest rates, which is awesome. Well, you know what? I think the bell was rung yesterday um, and from one of my clients, one of my more emotional clients, you know, he tends to... Um, you know, just like shoot from the mouth, no filter, right? Whatever hits in his brain comes right out. So he says, Bobby, I, I love those 5.3% treasuries. Why don't we just get rid of our, our portfolio and just load up the boat? And I said, you mean get rid of those municipals that have a tax equivalent yield of almost 8% based on your bracket to get a 5% return? Well, well, maybe not those, but find something else. I like that. I like that 5%. I love it. I like 5%. I said, well, I like 10 better. So uh, why don't you just let me run the ship here? Well, well the other... The other interesting uh, component to what's going on right now is we talk about this a lot. It's just like these strategists that were dead wrong. They all they do is they keep pushing out their predictions. Well, you know, the recession isn't today. It's going to be in six months. And when six months when it doesn't come, it's going to be in another six months. Um, but, you know, what's, what's remarkable is I don't even think that we're going to not only not go into recession, but if you start looking at the data, if anything, growth is actually going to start picking up. So never mind slowdown. We're going to see a reacceleration of growth going into next year. And there's so many reasons. And one of the biggest reasons is there's so much cash out there. Well, there's a lot of cash out there, but uh, what are they going to spend it on? And I think one of the things that uh, what's interesting about this so-called recession, uh, we had a lot of signs, right? We had the inverted yield curve. We had interest rates going straight up from the Fed. I could see where, you know, emotionally you would say, hey, we got to have a recession. But, you know, everyone forgot about the stimulus, the gigantic stimulus that the government's created, you know, basically to fix the supply chain, to do onshoring, nearshoring. Now I hear a new term called friendshoring. Um, <laughs> so there's going to be a lot of building, a lot of stimulus 
which is, you know, productive. It's, it's going to increase GDP. So, you know, I think it's um, it's different this time um, is what these economists didn't get. And, you know, again, hey, everything's still uncertain, guys. There's, it's never certainty. But remember, diversification is the only hedge against uncertainty. Well, you know, speaking of diversification, I actually got a text from one of my clients the other day saying, hey, you know, the market looks really cheap here. You know, do you think it's a good time to really start buying some of these really undervalued asset classes like Tesla? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, where I, I said, well, you what's that? In trouble when Tesla is now considered an asset class. <laughs> like, that's a problem. Yeah. I said, well, you know, Tesla is still trading pretty expensively. He's like, no, 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 it's cheap. And I said, well, it's trading at 72 times earnings. So, you know. If you want to wait 720 years uh, to get your returns, you know, be my guest. Well, you know, guys, it's uh, it's kind of like the 90s again, where I would have prospects and clients call me up and say, I want to buy Cisco. And I'll go, well, do you know what Cisco does? She said, yeah, they do routers. You know, like they dig the holes in the ground and, and they ground to put the cable down for the for the computer systems. And I'm like, you don't even know what Cisco does. And the <laughs> same thing's happening now with NVIDIA. Everybody wants to buy NVIDIA. Why? It has something to do with AI, but I don't exactly know what it is, but I want to own it. Yeah, we're in that, that situation. You know, AI, uh, the future, right? C computing uh, CPUs, GPUs. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't even really know what a GPU is, let's be honest. Um, but no, I think the other interesting thing that's happened the last couple of weeks is that broadening out of the rally, right? Like the dollars start to plummet. Emerging markets all of a sudden have perked up overnight. Um, if you look at Latin America, I mean, those economies are doing really well right now. Those stock markets are up huge this year and their manufacturing indexes are at a peak. And those markets trade really, really cheap along with small caps, mid caps. So um, there's just so many places to put your money right now. The big mistake we see investors making is buying the winners that have already gone up. And tech right now is just screaming overvalued. It may stay overvalued for a while, but you got to diversify here. Well, you know, it's funny. I was talking to a friend of mine, a sailing buddy of mine. He's looking to buy a house uh, down in Miami and um, he's going to be taking some money out of his portfolio. And he said, well, you know, I said, I said, is your portfolio fairly conservative? He said, yes. He's like, you know, I, I own something that's been very stable. It's, it's consistently outperformed the S&P 500. It was the Vanguard Technology <laughs> Fund. And I just happened to mention to him, I said, you know, that fund was down well over 33% last year. I said, you know, I don't think that's real stable. Well, see, Chris, it's like the, when they had the real estate boom in, in 2006 and people would say, well, you know, real estate never goes down. It goes sideways and, you know, stays sideways for a while. And then it goes to a higher level, never goes down. You know, it's like the, people want to believe what they want to believe. It's amazing. You know, and Courtney, I watch you on CBC when you're on every week. And it just seems like, you know, a lot of these strategists and experts you're on with, they just keep talking about the same stocks over and over again, whether it's Meta, Amazon, Facebook, NVIDIA. You know, what are you, what are you seeing most of these strategists recommending and usually pretending like they weren't bearish and now they're not bearish, but it just seems like that's all anyone's talking about on CNBC. It's all they're talking about. There has been so much excitement with artificial intelligence. And I think as investors, we're really starting to listen to that. Everyone's saying, oh, this has to be the next thing. Let's put our money there. And everything else is getting left by the wayside right now. And I think it's one of those things where you want to be cognizant of. You don't always just want to follow the herd. You want to make sure that you're looking for good opportunities, things that are well valued. And you brought this up a lot, but we have plenty of opportunities, whether it's abroad, it's in small companies, it's things like energy. A lot of things have just been left by the wayside side this year are and are up, but not nearly as much as our, all these things that have to do with artificial intelligence. So it very well may be the next thing, but how much of that is already priced in and how much of that are you just playing catch up on? I would start to look at some of these other areas right now. And that's what we've been doing for a lot of our clients. Well, clearly, if we're not going to have a recession, or at least going to be postponed mm -hmm. for God knows how long going to these strategists, um, you know, things like small and mid cap stocks tend to outperform large company stocks. You have you know, the dollar uh, starts to weaken and you get uh, you know, you get a bid, catch a bid with international and emerging markets and commodities. So there's plenty of opportunity. Um, and I just don't understand why most investors don't live by, you know, buy low and sell high. It's it's always the reverse, you know, buy high and panic low. Yeah. Um, so it's just, you know, investing is really easy if you think long term. It's that short term nature that drives everybody a little insane. Yeah, and I think good investing is about forward looking, right? And, you know, it's in the tea leaves right now or the writing's on the wall. We had like $122 billion worth of construction and manufacturing over the last year. Like big companies like General Motors, Intel, U.S. Steel, they're all building factories here in the USA. So you think about industrials and you think about like next year's an election year. Politicians are going to spend a lot of money on infrastructure, right? So 
you know, money's being spent in a lot of different areas and all you hear about is tech, but what happens is you're missing all these other trends happening and it's happening in plain sight. So it's really, really important to kind of avoid the noise, spread out that money, because whatever happened the last 10 years, whatever happened the last year, odds are the next couple of years aren't going to look the same as an investor. So you got to be forward looking, not backward, backward looking. You know, guys, I just uh, I was just hanging out with a bunch of clients playing golf this week. And then they said, well, you know, clearly you guys were optimistic when everybody was pessimistic. And, and really, what were your clues? And I said, well, there were a lot. But I said, the biggest one was 11 million job openings. And, you know, all three, all four of his own companies and we employ people. So let's face it. We don't give people jobs because we're just nice guys. Right. We gave people jobs because we need it, you know, to get the, the work done. Um, when you have 11 million job openings, that means there's a lot of demand. And we're seeing that even even Taiwan Semiconductor decided to build a huge plant here in, in Arizona. They have to delay the plant a year now because they can't get the workers. And I hear that from everybody. So that means that the demand on the economy is still good. Economy's growing. Inflation's going down. You know, GDP up, inflation down. I think the stock market's going to continue to love it. Hey, hope you're enjoying episode 129, Pain Points of Wealth. Everything you hear on this podcast, along with some due diligence of your own, can help you get ahead at any stage of your journey. Chris, Bob, and I, and Courtney have a collective 75 years helping individuals just like you with your planning and investing. I mean, this is literally what we do every single day. So if you've saved over a million dollars and you want a more hands-on approach, you want a second opinion, here's your shot. Bob, Chris, Courtney, and I will put together our total financial master plan, and we'll do that with no obligation or cost if you've saved over a million dollars. We literally build you your own personalized financial portal. We'll give you a bird's eye view of your entire financial life, and we'll hone in on every financial issue you need to address today, whether it's an income plan for retirement, how to take Social Security, how to draw from your portfolio without running out of money. Inflation is going to double over the next 20 years. We're going to look at fees and taxes. Wall Street loves to sell you high-cost products that have high fees and are very tax inefficient. Whether it's an annuity, mutual fund, brokerage product, structured product, we're going to do a deep dive of every investment you own, and we're going to look at diversification. Has your portfolio been like a yo-yo the last two years as markets been all over the place? We're going to do a full analysis of your portfolio, show you where your diversification could be better, or if you're sitting in cash, paralysis by analysis, trying to figure out what to do, we'll put together a full investment game plan, show you how to grow your money, but most importantly, protect it over the rest of your life. Simply go to www.paincm.com slash financial plan to see if you qualify for a free financial review. All right, it's the tipping point. This is where we pinpoint the pain point. Of course, that's P-A-Y-N-E, having the biggest impact on your wealth right now. And Bob, Chris, and Courtney, you know, at our firm, Pain Capital Management, we're getting a lot of questions right now about what do you do with your cash? I mean, we've seen the Fed now raise interest rates 11 times. You're getting like 5% on a treasury money market fund right now. I mean, rates are really, really good. But we're finding that a lot of you are making bad decisions. So I thought we could talk about like what you should be thinking about right now with the fact that rates are a lot higher than they were, like, frankly, a year ago. Well, you know, there's tons of cash everywhere. And, and whether you have it in a brokerage account, or you have it in a money market fund or have a bank, just remember all these institutions call their savings accounts money market funds. Doesn't mean you're getting money market yield. Uh, I've got a research account at my old firm. I just checked the statement this morning, guys. They're paying me one basis point on my cash. One. <laughs> Yeah, it's actually, I, I talked to a client of mine the other day, and they have their money at a credit union in a, uh, a money market, and they're getting 2%. And she said, uh, do you guys think you could do better? And I said, anything the banks can do, we can do better. <laughs> I think it's a song like that, Chris. We should sing it once. Yeah, that was, that's, that's, that's what I was quoting. <laughs> <laughs> you're very perceptive today, Bob. What's even worse, though, is when you're getting the interest on whether it's a money market or you have a treasury fund or whatever the case may be, you're paying taxes on that money. So you get that measly 1%, Bob. But also, you're going to pay tax. You're not even getting the full 1%. And that's Court, what I It was worse was. than that. I, I was getting one basis point, not even 1%. Oh, no, not goodness. 100 basis point. <laughs> one basis point. I mean, I know, missed that. <laughs> the arrogance of that firm. Oh. And the tax. And the tax. Yeah, exactly. Not and one meanwhile, you know, we're getting 5% in yeah. our accounts. I mean, that's a 4.9% that's a commission they're charging me on my cash. Which is crazy. Yeah. And that's where we've had a lot of people calling in and saying, okay, what else can we do with our cash? And they've been looking at treasuries or certificates of deposit and ways of getting close to that 5%, which is being offered right now, which is great. But it is always important to keep in mind that taxes are going to be in effect. 
and even treasuries. Actually, this has been a common question for clients, so I don't know if people understand this, but they are taxed at a federal level. From a state and a local level, you actually get the tax break, which is great. But the federal level is your higher tax bracket anyway, and you are still paying the tax on that. And that's where you don't want to have necessarily too much money in cash yeah. or be looking at some more tax efficient options, depending on where your tax bracket lies. Another one of those urban legends, Chris, everybody thinks that treasuries are taxable and that Ryan's good looking. You know, I mean, it's just like it's, it's amazing how many calls I get. That I have to just well, you know, tell them what's really going on. First off, beauty is not debunked. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, number one. Um, <laughs> so I'm sure someone out there finds me uh, to be attractive. But no, I think the other this. Hey, now I know why tigers eat their young. That's what I'm getting to say. <laughs> but then, the court does make a great point. Is we we sat down with a with a new client the, the other week, and they had millions of dollars sitting in treasuries. They're in a extremely high tra 40 percent tax bracket, the highest no. tax bracket you can be in. And we're like, dude, you're paying taxes on all this. He's like, what? I thought treasuries were tax free. And we're like, no, they're not. It's amazing. So when you're getting five percent, like after the taxes, you're only getting under three percent. So and meanwhile, you can buy a portfolio of tax free bonds paying between three and four percent. So that tax uh, implicate the tax implications are so critical, and most of us aren't paying attention to that. No, but they are exempt on a state level. But a lot of our clients have moved to Florida to eliminate state tax anyway. But you know, hey, it's just uh, it's good to clear that up because there there truly is this misconception. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the big questions that I get is, you know, Dad, you had mentioned this earlier, is okay. You know, we're getting five percent on some of these money markets. You know, we're getting you know four and a half five percent on these short term treasuries and CDs. You know, doesn't it make sense for us to put all of our money in those because we really only need a five percent rate of return on our money to reach our goals? And you know, the answer is no because what people forget is that these rates are floating. They don't, they're not here to last forever. Well, yeah. actually, Chris, it, it's yes, if you're going to promise us you're going to die in one year, because then we don't have to worry about, <laughs> you know, the subsequent years of return, right? Um, yeah, so it's all about, you know, building a diversified portfolio to get to your goals. I mean, it's, you know, having a goal-based strategy is the only common sense way to invest money. And it's, it's amazing how very few of our competitors actually do it that way. Yeah. No, it's a good point. Like, Courtney, you made a really good point earlier is with the Fed raising rates this past week, there's a good chance next year they could start cutting interest rates. Um, and that means that those 5% rates you're getting on those short-term bonds might be like 3% when you go to reinvest, and we call that reinvestment risk. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that's that's something to keep in mind as an investor is you don't want to keep too much money in these products or too much money short term because as great as the 5% is, we very well might be out of luck in a year from now when these things mature and we're at lower rates. Yeah. So that's where you don't want to put everything in your CDs or your treasuries. Having some money there is great. It's a really good cash alternative. But we're finding clients are probably having, I would say, too much in cash and too much in that bucket because they're getting really comfortable with the 5%. We can be coming with an end of this, so you want to make sure you have a longer ter term plan in place. Well, it's tricky right now because you have what you call an inverted yield curve. And, and the rationale is, well, I can get 5% on a one-year treasury. Why would I lock in for eight years at 4%? And that's where you're like being penny-wise dollar foolish because at that 4%, you're locked in for eight years. If rates go down, you're not locked in at that 5% for very long. And this is where you have to make smart decisions. And I think most investors right now aren't making those smart decisions. No, clearly they're not. And it's, um, it, it is surprising to me when you find out how much cash people keep on the sidelines. Um, it's kind of like an all or none proposition, right? They just, they kind of get stressed out and they think they're running behind. They take too much risk or they don't take enough risk. A little bit of planning is can nip that in the bud every time. Well, another question that we get a lot is, guys, why do we buy bonds individually when it could be just so easy to go out and buy bonds in a mutual fund? You know, they're, they're marketed like a bond, so it must work just like a bond, right? I'm glad you brought that up, Chris, because Bob just loves bond funds. Well, you know the rule in our household. You know, most families have a swear jar. If you say no. bond fund, you have to put a dollar in a jar. Chris, uh, I think you just you owe me like five dollars now. <laughs> well, you know, I've always said that bond funds are like the Trojan horse of bonds. You know, they're called bonds. They're marketed like bonds, but they don't act like bonds. And why I say this is because there's no set date of maturity. They don't have a set interest. And you're, they're volatile because you're invested with millions other of emotional people. Yeah, it's heads you lose, tails you lose, right? When rates are going up. You lose because people are bailing out of their bond funds. Rates are going down. People are pouring money into the bond funds, and they're diluting your yield, right? Because they can't yeah. they can't buy a five percent coupon bond when rates are two percent, right? And when do people put most of their money into bonds or panic into bonds is when rates are dropping. So I learned a long time ago. I learned back in the '70s that these things don't work. 
Um, the firm benefits, right? The firm makes money. The stockbroker makes money. Two out of three is not bad. You know, the client doesn't do so well. But, you know, that's uh, <laughs> good odds for the firm, bad odds for the investor. Well, I think the biggest issue with these is the fact that the rate isn't set. You know, just like buying those short-term treasuries, um, you know, if interest rates change, uh, the, the rates on the bonds are going to change, you know, because what you'll have is you'll have people, you know, selling out of those bonds, the manager buys and sells different bonds. So there's no, there's really nothing to depend on when you own a bond fund. So you might as well just go out and buy like the S and P 500 or something, same volatility. Yeah. Well, I think it blows my mind guys is they didn't only, they only stick to the prospectus, right? The prospectus will say they're supposed to invest in certain asset classes. And then when you see something blow up in the bond market, sure enough, you find out, well, who was buying this garbage? It turned out to be bond funds are trying to juice their yields. Um, you know, they buy non-rated stuff, junk stuff. I mean, it's just, you got to know what you own. You got to know why you own it. And a bond fund will never do that for you. Well, yeah. And the other thing too, is we're, we're in a time now where you can buy government bonds going out five, 10 years and you're getting between four and 5%. So it's like, why screw that up? Keep your bond money as safe as possible. You know, I think the other misconception too is, you know, remember when you buy that bond for two, two years, it pays 5%, that treasury or sitting in that money market at 5%. That's all you're ever going to get. And the other part of your this equation is when you buy stocks over the long term, the dividend's increasing. So maybe you're only getting 3% on a stock portfolio, but that's increasing over time. So that 3% five years now could be like 8%, right? So it's a rising cash flow investment. So, you know, it's so important right now that when you're looking at your portfolio, you're designing it and you're looking at the income component, you have to start thinking about the long game, not the short game. And that is about having rising dividends to keep up with inflation. That means locking in to longer term yields right now while rates are higher, because like anything else, market conditions change quick. And when they do, you know, it's like the tide goes out, you want to be swimming naked. And I think that's one of the biggest mistakes investors are making right now. So basically, guys, what I hear you saying is that you can't make money in bonds, so don't lose money in bonds, right? It's return of your money not the return on your money. If you need to make money, you want to be in the equity market. And that's kind of the problem. You know, like people don't want to be diversified because they want to be perfect. They want to be precisely correct. Well, I checked. When you're not precisely right, you're absolutely wrong. And then you don't achieve your goals. So having a simple, well-diversified portfolio to me is common sense. But you know, the biggest thing missing on Wall Street in the 50 years that I've observed it is common sense. All right, it's the Hidden Facts of Finance, random financial facts that may surprise you or even shock you. All right, Bob, European members of NATO and Canada are expected to boost defense spending by 8.3% this year to $356 billion, faster than the 2% increase last year and 2.8% jump in 2021, according to NATO. This year's defense spending increased by NATO's European members in Canada is higher than any annual increase over the past decade, including the prior fastest spending increase of 5.9%, which is back in 2017. Looks like countries around the world are increasing that defense spending a lot. All you got to do is say the word Putin, right? I mean, it just makes sense when they just, uh, you know, go in and, and invade countries. Um, you know, I can see where the defense spending will only go up. Um, you got, uh, you know, China's building up their military. You don't know what their intentions are. You see what happened with Russia. It makes a lot of sense. Plus, you know, defense stocks have got to be a good buy because we're depleting their inventories, helping Ukraine out. So I think, you know, unfortunately, globally, spending on, on weapons is going to continue to increase. Yeah, definitely. Definitely another sector to be looking at right now outside of tech. All right, Chris, the Bureau of Economic Analysis reported that from the first quarters of 2022, to 2023, interest payments by the federal government rose from an annual rate of $603 billion to $929 billion, a $325 billion increase. This was a 54% rise in one year, increasing the average interest rate paid on the federal debt from 2.1% to 3.01%. Higher interest rates are hurting our government spending as well. It's not pretty. Yeah, it just goes to show you that a 1% increase can have a pretty drastic impact when you're dealing with billions and trillions of dollars. Yeah, it also hopefully puts a fire under the uh, federal government's uh, backside to actually start to reduce the deficit. But I don't know, maybe that's like uh, wishful thinking. Uh, you know, those baby boomer politicians only care about baby boomers. They don't really care about you guys. So they, <laughs> they've already spent your future. I'm sorry. Yeah. Hey, your generation, Bob, your generation. Yes. <laughs> All right, here we go. Courtney, 
Wall Street loves spotting new themes for stock buyers, but many fizzle. Three years ago, investment bankers marveled over TAMs, remember that? Total addressable markets for meatless burgers and big screen exercise machines. Since then, Beyond Meat and Peloton Interactive have fallen each by over 85%. It kind of reminds me of like all the hype around AI we're having right now. That was my exact thought. AI is exactly what came to mind because that's the big hype this year. And, you know, I don't know if it's going to fall off the way that Pelotons are now just coat hangers for everybody in their houses. Um, <laughs> but I think what people tend to do is that they get really excited about what's going to happen in the short term. But I think AI may be a much longer term story. I don't think people are, are anticipating, but maybe overexcited in the short term. And I wouldn't get caught in that trap. I agree. And do we do you have a Peloton? I can't remember. I do which um, normally gets very good use. Um, you know, I have a baby coming, so I have got a little less use of it, but I, I have a fair excuse. <laughs> well, speaking of AI, do we have any proof this is actually Courtney today? <laughs> your point? <laughs> There's no Q computer that can replicate the, the, the famous Courtney Garcia. So. It'll never get that perfect. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for being on with us today, Court. It's always a pleasure. My pleasure. Another great show. If you love our podcast, like our podcast, please give us that five-star rating on iTunes. Leave us a comment there. Tell everyone how great we are. They need to know. If this is on Spotify, you can subscribe to our channel. If you're watching this on YouTube right now, you can like this episode. You can subscribe and click that notification bell to be up updated every week of all our new content. That's it for this week's Pain Points of Wealth. Stay loose and keep an open mind.